This podcast is a quest for well-being, a quest for a meaningful life through the exploration of fundamental truths, enlightening ideas, insights on physical, mental, and spiritual health. The inspiration is love. The aspiration is to awaken new ways of thinking that can lead us to a new way of being, being well. Welcome to Body, Mind, and Soul Healing Conversations. If vision therapy is a method in which to make the eye and the brain train together so they can work better together, what is patching? Patching trains one eye to work harder to catch up with the other. This is not a scientific description, but if one eye is communicating and working better with the brain, it is dominating use of the brain. Patching helps so that good eye can take a time out, so the brain has some time to work with the weaker eye. Being a parent faced with the choices of VT or patching is not a simple place to be, but working at all to try to make the vision and the eyes better is the goal. Respecting varied methods seems to make sense. Paige would love to see more case studies and vision therapy become covered for the families who want to have it. Ideally, many doctors and vision therapists could start working together more and the length of time these patchers have to work can become less. Valeria Tellez interviews Paige Broughton. She is the founder of Seaworthy Patches. Paige was born and raised in New Jersey and has since relocated to Hawaii, where she's flourished as an entrepreneur and lived for more than 20 years. After founding her first company, a maternity boutique in Honolulu, she sold the business in 2008 to focus on motherhood after the birth of her first daughter, Eddie, in 2009, who inspired the creation of Seaworthy Patches. At five years old, an annual checkup detected that Eddie had symptoms of refractive amblyopia, a treatable condition that stunts the development of vision. Treatment required her to wear an eye patch for several hours a day. Shortly thereafter, Seaworthy Patches was born. Paige is a devoted wife, mother, sister, and daughter, and draws inspiration from her family and families with similar plights. Her professional focus is solely on Seaworthy Patches, and she relies on her experiences as a former educator to connect with kids and parents who stand to benefit from her product. Meet Paige at worthybrands.com. Here's the interview with Paige Broughton. In your own words, who is Paige Bratton? Well, I am the creator of Worthy Brands. I am a mom. I am a wife, sister, daughter. I am a happily busy person. Oh, I love that. <laughs> I enjoy being busy. Yeah. I love that. That's interesting that you say that. I usually add <laughs> that too. Every time I want to say that I'm busy, I'm like, I'm happily busy. Wait a minute. Yeah. Not just busy. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I'm very happily busy. I don't think I'd be happy if I wasn't busy. <laughs> mm. That's interesting that you say that too, because I study a lot of the ancient spiritual teachings, Hinduism, Buddhism, and they do talk about being a human body that has to do with karma, and karma means action, doing. So how interesting that you say that, because it made me reflect about just now in the moment, how by being active, we can also be happy. So karma is not a bad thing. If karma is being the human body <laughs> as, as a human. Yes. So hmm. do you have any spiritual beliefs or practices or views, Paige? Well, I was raised, actually, um, my mom is Jewish and my dad is uh, Episcopalian. So I was raised with both religions or those two formal organized religions. Um, And on one hand, I guess I could say it was confusing. (laughs) On the other hand, (laughs) I always say I feel really welcome in 
both a church or a temple or synagogue. And I know all the songs. And um, I was bat mitzvah. There is part of me that um, the Judaism religion resonates a little more. But I always felt like if I chose a religion, it was like choosing a parent. So I, I, I think in my younger years, and particularly my like early 20s, when I kind of felt maybe more confused about um, spirituality, I I wound up kind of accidentally, and it just wound up becoming a great thing for me. I took a very deep dive into yoga and explored lots of different types of yoga and really studied a lot of the spirituality of yoga. And um, I think for me, it really helped resonate for me just having spirituality, believing in a higher power is really all anyone needs. It really doesn't matter how you formalize it. And, and then, and that having that kind of faith, I think matters, you know, for, for most people. And, and for me, you know, just having that belief and then, and then not choosing a specific one, um, was freeing for me. And so, it's not necessarily that I would worship to one God or another, but I do believe in a God and, and all of that. So that I would, I would, I guess say that was, is my spirituality. Yeah. I love that. So that is being open to uh, the human experience as it is, because we're so different and so many things happen. Yeah. I love that page. A beautiful answer. Yeah. No, there's, there's a really great book called Holy Cow. Mm. It's about a woman and it's, it's sort of autobiographical and she goes to India for her husband's job. And then she's a journalist and she winds up writing this great story about how basically all religions are really, really strong in India, Catholicism, Zoroastrianism, and it, it just this kind of melting pot of religion that is there. And it was, it's just a really cool book to read about so many different types of religions and how similar they are and how if you kind of just take away the titles. Yeah. You know, spirituality is spirituality. That makes me think about human beings as well. They're, we're just different. <laughs> it's so diverse. Mm -hmm. But in the end, we are all looking for the same things, basically happiness, peace. Mm -hmm. So... Yeah. Love. Oh, yes, of course. How can I forget love? <laughs> yes. Uh, yes, Paige. Another open question is about success. How do you define success these days? Hmm. I mean, I think success obviously looks different for all people. And for me, um, I mean, I think you're successful when you're happy, when you feel content with what you've accomplished. And um, you know, it's super unique to what your goals are. Um, and, you know, for me, I feel, I always feel really successful as a mom. I just look at my girls and I think they're so wonderful and I'm so proud of them. And, and I feel successful in that way. Um, but then when I look at my business, I might put different goals on myself and have different goals and consider achieving those goals, that success. Um, I mean, I definitely believe I succeeded in creating this business and helping people. And that feels really great. But I definitely have other goals that I want to reach. It's success and happiness kind of one and the same from your perspective? Or they are somewhat separate? Mm -hmm. uh, they're, yeah, they're, they're similar but different, I think. Um, because you can be happy without a lot of financial success, but financial success might be more rewarding to other people or to some people. Um, and I think if you have goals and you aren't achieving them, you may not feel, one may not feel successful. Um, you know, but, but I think, you know, and some people might not have that care if they meet their goals and then they'd be happy. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. I guess for me, I, I, I feel happier when I achieve them. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, that's uh, the way we interpret those ideas, right, Paige? We are so unique. I agree. And another open question is about the purpose of the human experience. What do you think that is? To love. I think the whole 
purpose of existence is is to love and to help and make the world a better place as best as you can. And I think even if not everyone has the power to, you know, create a product or a service that helps others, I mean, just giving love to the people around you is making the world better for them. Mm. So, I mean... I think that's fundamentally what happens, you know, I think having good intentions and loving people's the goal. Oh, I love that answer. Of course. What's not to love about you, about that beautiful, <laughs> beautiful answer. <laughs> the purpose of the human experience being love. Yeah, yeah I agree. Yeah. A trillion times to that. And yeah. another question is about, yeah, with that in mind, actually, let me ask you this question. What do you love most about being in the human body? Hmm. I don't know. I mean, I think the the amount of things that the human body can do is is pretty amazing. You know, whether you're a triathlete or you're a uh, you know dancer or you're a pregnant woman. I mean, there's just so many things the body can do. You're a recovering cancer patient. Your body can heal. I mean, the body is, is just having one of these things is amazing. You know, the, all the things it can do, it grows, it sh shrinks, it swells, it, <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. having one is, is pretty amazing. I love that too. Having one, it's amazing anyway, right? <laughs> <laughs> having a body is pretty is a pretty incredible thing, you know, and they're, and they're all so unique and different and, you know, tall and short and dark and light and, you know, it's mm. just great. <laughs> Yeah, I, I do see human beings as nature. I don't separate us from nature itself. <laughs> yeah. So that makes sense. <laughs> it resonates true yeah. the way you say yeah. it. And another open question is about healing. What is healing to you? And what are some of the misconceptions we have about healing? Well, I mean, I think it depends. I mean, I'm, like emotional healing and physical healing are, are somewhat separate, right? And in both cases, though, you know, if you had a wound, a physical wound, it's obviously easy to see how it mends and it turns into a scar and then maybe that scar even, you know, dissipates. But I think emotionally you can use that that same kind of wound as a metaphor, you know, and, and it just takes time and, and nurturing, you know, to heal And I, I think a human, we often in our busy lives kind of forget that emotional healing does take nurturing, whether it's self-love or from the person who maybe caused the pain. Um, it just doesn't go away without, without that, you know, without wound care. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. Wisely said too. I love that page. So it takes time, not just time, but nurturing, right? Attention, being aware I agree, yeah. especially emotional health. That's mm -hmm. um, what a great reminder. Sometimes we give so much attention to the, the physical body and when it's not right, some of us do, and we don't <laughs> pay attention to the how mental state, how emotional state, right? But it's that balance, right. right, between both. And sometimes I do believe that the mind influences the body and the body influences the mind. They are not separate anyway. They are so connected. Yeah, they're very intertwined, yeah. Symbiotic. At this time, what is the world's greatest need? Oh, I think, oh gosh, water, food, compassion. <laughs> It's really hard to, to pick a direction. I think the world is pretty needy right now. You know, I, I, education. I mean, I just think if you look at how many people are believing what they're reading and what they're reading isn't right. And just being able to decipher information correctly so that we can all live more harmoniously would be nice. Um, yeah, there's, a, there's so much that it needs. It's really hard to pinpoint one. Yes, I agree. Wholeheartedly agree. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. in a way, right, Paige, that we have all these needs as humanity. But yeah, it is life the way it, it is happening. So there's no, I try not to reject anything that is happening, but just see deeper what is that that I can do if I want to see the world to become more peaceful then my job is to become more peaceful myself mm. within and among my family members just let's start there uh, so you're the founder and CEO of Worthy Brands and the creator of Seaworthy Patches 
talk to me about the main inspiration and intention behind your brand and this beautiful product. Sure. Well, I think the best way to talk about that is is basically to tell you the story of how it happened. And um, I know we touched uh, earlier on the fact that you have some familiarity with um, your eye, your experience mm, with your yeah. vision as a child. Yeah. And um, similarly, I, as a parent, I had no idea that you know the American Board of Pediatrics says that you should take your child to see an eye doctor by age three. And, you know, I have a graduate degree in education and child development. I've taken my children to every single one of their pediatrician appointments that they were intended to go, you know, meant to go to. Um, and nobody, nobody informed me of this. I didn't know how I, I could have, my child was meeting all of her benchmarks. And I, so I, I didn't, think she needed to see an eye doctor. I considered it like a specialist, you know, like, uh, the same, I wouldn't need to see a heart specialist. Her heart was beating fine. But, um, when she was turning, you know, she wasn't walking into walls. She had reading readiness. And when she turned five and we went to her regular pediatrician appointment before she started kindergarten, you know, she kind of failed the like mini eye chart test they do in all pediatricians offices. And they're like, oh, you need to see an eye doctor. She needs glasses, which I wasn't alarmed. Many children need to wear glasses. I think the statistic is about one in 10. Um, but because it was summer and so many doctors travel in the summer, we couldn't get an eye doctor appointment for a few months. Again, I wasn't really alarmed. And then, um, this weird thing happened. We were actually in a shopping mall and she said, mama, I can't see. And I said, what? And I thought, I said to her, well, are you hungry? And she said, why, why would being hungry? (laughs) (laughs) But I was like thinking maybe she was so hungry. She was about to faint. Like she was seeing spots, like about to faint or something like low blood sugar. Like I, I, cause I just didn't, think that she was like losing vision. And then I had this memory of needing to see an eye doctor immediately. And so we went to, so I immediately called like a friend who worked in an eye doctor's office. And I said, listen, we can't get in. And we really need, you know, this thing happened. We actually stopped at like a, um, a shopping mall eye doctor. And he was like, no, I can't help you. You need to see an ophthalmologist. And so I called this friend to see if, um, she could explain things better. And immediately her office called me and said, come in first thing tomorrow morning, you know, at 8 a.m. And so my husband and I brought our daughter in and, you know, she just went through a battery of tests all day from one room to the next to the next. No, no waiting. And um, my husband went with her to one of these tests and the eye doctor kept me in the room and said to me, well, what did the the man at the mall, the eye doctor at the mall say? And I said, well, he said, she thought, she might be going blind in one eye. And she said, okay, she's not going blind in one eye, but she's going blind in both. And, um, she's close. She's blind, you know, in both eyes and the way that her optic nerve presents itself, it could be caused by brain tumors. And I really couldn't handle that information. I can imagine. (laughs) Um, when we got home from the eye doctor, like my husband looked at me and was like, I don't know what that doctor said to you, but you are not the same woman as you were this morning. And if you look like that, I can't handle it. And I was like, so he's like, I can't handle it if you can't handle it. I'm like, so what do you want me to do? He's like, well, just don't tell me what she said until after we have the other tests. I was like, what, what? (laughs) He and I made this like funny little, I guess, agreement where he took care of a lot of things around the house. And I mostly just cried in our bedroom because I was the one having to hold that information. But in that dark hour, I made a pact with the universe or with God or whatever you want to call it that, you know, I just was crying and praying. And I thought, well, you know, I can, maybe I can handle a blind child, but I can't handle like cancer and losing my child. I just can't, you know? And if we can come out on the other side of this, I, I promise, like, I'll dedicate my whole life to helping people with this condition. I don't know how that'll look, but I promise I'll do it. You know? oh, that's beautiful. And then, you know, she had her MRI and there were no brain tumors and her optic nerve is, is okay. It's, it's basically just looks different the way I'm guessing your nose looks different than mine. <laughs> and, um, anyway, I, you know, I didn't know how I was going to keep up my end of the deal, but 
it really kind of unfolded really naturally, really organically. Um, you know, the process of, you know, seeing the eye doctor and the type of glasses she needed and that she was going to have to start wearing an eye patch. And so she had, <laughs> excuse me, a long lineage of, of um, things with her eye, severe hyperopia, astigmatism, strabismus, and reflective amblyopia and an inflamed optic nerve, um, or, or the majority of it. And um, amblyopia is kind of an umbrella diagnosis, but it affects one in 45 children, and it's the leading cause of childhood blindness. Um, however, it's treatable. So it's treated by wearing this eye patch. So she had to wear this eye patch for about eight hours a day, which is quite a long time to cover the stronger eye. So she was left with the weaker blind eye to try to learn to read, to try to walk across the street, everything. So it was, it was a stressful time. Um, but in that process, because she was a little older, you know, most children should be diagnosed or, you know, by, by age two or three with this because they're supposed to go to an eye doctor by then. So because she was so much older, you know, she was just like, mom, these patches are so awful. They're like teddy bears and baby stuff on them. <laughs> and, um, yeah. you know, I like by the time they're in kindergarten, they kind of know what like cool brands are and what, you yeah. know, what's <laughs> yeah. going on in the world. And so initially when I started out, I was like, well, I just want to make these things look better. If they look better, it'll be easier for children to wear. And then as I started out to try to figure out how to produce them and make them, I realized there's so many other things I can do to make it better. I can make it a more breathable material, a better adhesive. I, you know, they're biodegradable. I did all these things so that it just, it really, really like revolutionized. It's the first time this product has innovated since the seventies. Oh, I wow. changed the shape so that it fits the eye socket better. I, you know, and it, it's just so much more comfortable to wear. And, and I mean, I almost daily get these emails from moms like, thank you so much. My child's eye isn't bleeding anymore. And it's just so rewarding to know. And I, and of course I created this business knowing that I would, I didn't want anyone to go through what I went through and not that I can prevent that, but I try to invest in, um, a lot of awareness campaigns so that families know to see eye doctors early, right. you know, for early detection is the yeah. best. So yeah. I donate a portion of my proceeds to early detection vision screening programs. And it, that has been really just wonderful to work with those programs and help see what I've been watching children get to see. It's so cool. It's really amazing. So that is how it all came about. It was really like I wanted to keep up my end of the deal where, you know, my daughter can see. And well, in, in fact, she not only didn't have brain tumor, she also can see now after all these treatments, she can see and she doesn't, you know, she can wear contacts and she doesn't need to wear a patch. And I don't, you know, you, when you have a child, you, of course, you know, dream big, right? You want them to like go to Harvard and all the things, but you know, when she was five, I was just like, oh gosh, I'll just be grateful if she can cross the street, you know, safely when you don't know if they can see ever. It's so scary. And um, she's on Dean's list. She's getting straight A's. She can read, she can write. She's amazing at math. I mean, she's, she's really thriving. So that is how it all started. And then, uh, about a year or two ago, I was contacted by some oncology nurses that let me know they were using my eye patches to help cancer patients. And coincidentally, my dad was battling stage four lymphoma in, in the process of getting chemo. And because it was COVID, um, you know, and he had uh, cancer of his immune system, I couldn't go near him. You know, we couldn't be near him at all. He couldn't have anyone near him. I mean, oftentimes, even without COVID, people with cancer can't see their grandchildren because, you know, children often have a lot of germs and stuff. And when you're going through chemo, you have no immunity. Um, so I called him and I was like, Dad, tell me about this chemo port. You know, and he'd been so cavalier about cancer, like, oh, it's no big deal. I'm just taking care of it. I'll be fine, you know. And then I asked him about this chemo port. He's like, oh, it's so uncomfortable. And I have to put this cream on it. And I don't like it touching my shirt, <laughs> you know, like all this stuff. And he's like, you know, your mom and I went to CVS and we spent like hundreds of dollars in gauze and tape and none of it works. And then I was like, dad, why don't you try an eye patch? <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> and 
he did. And, you know, he, you know, brought it to his chemo center that he was going to. Anyway, um, long story short, I quickly organized my sister company to Seaworthy, Portworthy, where we basically have the same product, but we're just packaging it differently. And we've created some new designs that are a little um, more appropriate for, you know, cancer patients versus vision issues. And um, we're trying, you know, to help cancer patients now just, I mean, obviously we're not curing anything, but we are hoping, hopefully making a difficult journey better, easier, uh, more comfortable for sure. And um, not everyone who wears a chemo port needs a patch. Some people aren't bothered by it. Some people are more sensitive. Women often because the port is in your um, just under your collarbone and your chest, they'll have bra straps rub on it, and it can be really uncomfortable. So the patch really helps create some comfort for cancer patients. So we're hoping more people learn about portworthy soon too. I love your enthusiasm, and there's a lot of um, beautiful energy <laughs> behind your voice and the way you, you tell the story. It's just heartfelt too. You gave me chills. I almost cried here. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Paige, yeah. for being this strong and inspiring woman. And uh -huh. coming out of the challenge and then creating this product and this company to help others. I don't see anything more beautiful than that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> thank you so much. My pleasure. It's very rewarding. I love the designs. They are so beautiful. I was looking on your website and there is one, I love the colors, and there's one that say, don't ask. <laughs> that, that caught my attention immediately. <laughs> yeah. Uh, don't that, ask. That was really inspired by my daughter um, <laughs> because she hated it. And, you know, it's funny. It's, it's so hard to be a kid and look different in mm, any way, right? I know. And wearing an eye patch certainly, you know, is like, a big sign. Look at me. I'm different a little bit. And, and so she would often have me like take the skin color patches and, um, draw an eye, an eye on it. So it like looked inconspicuous for her. And, um, we were trying so hard to create an inconspicuous patch forever. And it's really hard because you want to be mindful of, you know, different skin tones. I mean, how many different color eyes there are out there. And there's no like one fit one, size fits all for that. And, um, she also used to always have me make patches that say, don't ask. <laughs> I love that. And, <laughs> and it's funny because like <laughs> other kids heart would uh, mostly always never notice. Like we could go to a playground and other kids would play with her yeah. and just be accepting. And it was right. never a big deal. Mm. It was always adults that would say something stupid. It would always be adults that say something really senseless and hurtful really. But it was always crazy to me that that, that was how it was. But um, so she always wanted the don't ask and an inconspicuous eye. And it took us actually a hmm. few years to figure out how to do that. Like I said, trying to be sensitive to all the different skin tones. And the partner to don't ask in its box is this comic book eye. that's kind of like, you know, red polka dots with like a beige background and then a gray eye because nobody really has that coloring. And it does work on a pretty good array, array of, of skin tones. But um and then the, the, we made the don't ask look like, you know, comic book, you know, yeah. just to match the comic book eye. Yeah, that's been a really fast seller. It just came on the market uh, a couple months ago. I love that one. And if I had to use one, I would use that one. <laughs> oh, <laughs> don't ask. <laughs> and yeah. I also love this, that you are working on oh, making this more aware, the stigma of being mm -hmm. different. It's okay to be different. It really amazes me that we as human beings, we're still stuck somewhere in this unaware, unconscious space of discrimination and judgment. Mm -hmm. It really, really amazes me. This is 2022 um, and we are still back there somewhere <laughs> in the past. Mm -hmm. But thank you so much for being open to life, Paige. This is what it comes across to me a lot of times when I see this innovation, creativity. It's just being inspired by life itself. So that's really precious to me, to my heart. There is um, a blog post that I read on your website that it's a question, the title. Will patching have long-term effects on my kids' confidence? And that has to do with stigma and all that. 
I would love to hear a bit more about this topic about kids, yeah, their confidence. Yeah, you know, that's funny. Yeah. <laughs> you s- I forgot, not forgot, but like I know I wrote that a long time ago. And now that you bring it up, it kind of reminds me. I feel like I should um, write a second one, like an amendment to that, because um, not an amendment, like it's different, but just having more experience as the years go by. Um, you know, undoubtedly, I think that wearing a patch can inhibit a, a child's confidence. Um, it's hard. It's hard to do. It's really hard to do. It's it's physically uncomfortable. It's really challenging on the eyes. It's it's really tiring for your eyes while you're at school, and you're different, and you're wanting to be the same. And you know, we were really lucky that we mostly had you know, really great experiences at school with really supportive teachers and peers and classmates. But I know that's not the same for everyone. And that a lot of people, you know, experience, you know, teasing or bullying or ostracizing and, um, in that, and that's terrible. So it is hard. And that, and that does definitely, let's say, bruise a child's self-confidence as they're, growing. And, and one of the things that I've always reminded my daughter when, you know, she's kind of having struggles and like last year she was a sixth grade girl and, you know, she was done patching, but you know, sixth grade middle school is, is really hard socially. And I think all the kids are, 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 and I, anyway, I started to see really, I don't think her self-confidence was any different than any of her peers that never wore a patch. I think it all just levels out. They, they get to middle school and you know, when she would start to feel, you know, maybe down on herself, I would always remind her, like, look at how much you've accomplished. Nobody else you know has gone from being blind to seeing. You did something nobody else you know did. And you're on Dean's list. Like, you've accomplished so much more than your other friends have. And I, I would say that that's okay to say to your child when they're, when they're questioning their confidence, no matter what it's about. But especially if you have a child that overcame a vision disorder or even it was a speech impediment, anything, you know, they, that's a huge accomplishment and they should feel proud of themselves and, and use that in their arsenal of, of confidence. Um, but yeah, in the end, I think it didn't, you know, I, I worried about it a lot when she was younger Sometimes I saw ways where it might have impacted her confidence when she was younger. But by the time she became in middle school where everyone is having, you know, challenges with confidence and self-esteem and bodies changing and, you know, even just like higher level math becoming harder for some kids and not other, you know, like there's so much change in, in middle school years. It's almost like having a toddler again, their changes so fast and, and I think that they're all kind of at the same level of confidence for the most part. And I realized it didn't, it didn't really affect her, you know, she's who she is. And this is part of why she is who she is. And, um, I would say in the end, it really didn't, it, it, and we try to use it as a strength for her at all times that she's accomplished something. I love this perspective and helps a lot to have parents like you and your husband. So that really, really helped. I call them uh, conscious parents. (laughs) I don't want to say spiritual. I know you have. Yeah, that sounds very highly spiritual to me. But uh, yeah, conscious. Thank you so much again, Paige, for being this reference uh, to all of us. Thank you. So um, I do have this another blog post that you titled Patching the Original Vision Therapy. Mm-hmm. So and you, you mentioned earlier that this actually was a therapy back in the, um, the 70s. I didn't know about this. Well, patching actually has been around for 200 years. Oh, really? But the adhesive patch, yeah, was, was developed in the 70s, I believe. And today there are different kinds of therapies. In that blog post you write, the general idea behind vision therapy is to help the brain and the eyes work together. Mm -hmm. Which is, uh, it makes sense to me because connectivity, everything is connected. So all therapy or healing modalities, that's the main goal. They aim to bring all parts together as a whole balance into the body, Mm -hmm. into the system. So, and I didn't know about patches. That's interesting. You brought this to my attention with our conversation today. Thank you so much again, Paige, for being you and doing what you do. Oh, 
My pleasure. So amblyopia, you know, is um, sometimes called lazy eye. So, which is kind of a, not a pretty term, but, um, and it's, it's not always that way, but in say 200 years ago, if someone had a crossed eye, they'd call it a lazy eye. You know, if both your eyes weren't focused straight and even hundreds of years ago, they figured that if you put that patch on the stronger eye, it would make that weaker eye forced to focus. It would force it to have to work because the other one was taken away. So wearing an eye patch and, you know, pirates used to wear eye patches. Um, so patches, you know, using an eye patch for different types of treatments for vision ha has existed for hundreds of years. So um, it is the OG, <laughs> the original gangster, but, uh, um, but vision therapy is a newer therapy and um, it's not covered by insurance and it's very expensive. Um, and not every family can afford to experiment with it. Um, and it is a bit of an experiment because it isn't really tried and true. And it isn't easier. I mean, it's, I wouldn't say that it's much easier than patching. There's a lot of homework, a lot of driving, a lot of appointments. It's, it's pretty impactful on the entire family to have to, um, do it. And, um, I mean, listen, we did it. We were like, we're going to do anything and everything we can to save our daughter's vision. So we tried it and I think it was helpful, but in every diagnosis is different. I'm not a doctor and I wouldn't tell someone you should or shouldn't do that, but it is more, it's generally more effective to stick with patching. And, and again, it's not, every case is not the same, but I'm glad we tried it and, and we did see some improvement, but ultimately it was patching that saved our daughter's vision. And, um, you know, I, I go to the, you know, pediatric ophthalmology conferences and there's always new technology trying to replace patching and, you know, they're all working on it. And, and honestly, anything that would make this easier for children is, is all I hope for. Even if it impedes my business, that's not important. I'd rather see these children have easier journeys. Uh, it's just that a lot of these new technologies are just new. They just don't, they're just not proven yet. And they're all very expensive. And most people just don't have the kind of money it takes to buy a virtual reality kit or sign up. You know, it's just a lot. And, but I mean, it will change eventually, I, I assume. But um, for now, it is the most effective and the most affordable way to save vision. I love to hear that too. And what comes to me as a question is, would that work for adults as well, Paige? Or this is just for children. Oh, well, there's a lot of different theories out there about it. Most um, doctors will say that patching really doesn't work much after puberty, you know, up until 12, maybe. Um, but there are a lot of studies. I saw a really incredible TED Talk once about, and that was more about vision therapy, that can help older people. And um, there isn't hope. I actually just, uh, like I said at this conference, I, I met these men and they have something that's actually specifically for patients, maybe like you, that had amblyopia as a child that was never treated that can work as an adult. And it's actually computer-based and it's like a program you sign up for. And, you know, I, t I actually had talked about it with a lot of ophthalmologists and they do think it, it's actually, you know, it's been um, FDA approved and it's, it's getting places. So it is for adults. I can share that information, you know, with you um, if you want. Um, it's not my company and it's uh, hard to access for most people. Oh. But um, it's called Revital Vision, and I can send you their contact if you're interested. Oh, yeah. Thank you, Paige. I would love to try that. Yeah, as I mentioned, off record, I think I didn't mention here on record, I had eye vision issues as a child and was never treated. And then I found out as an adult that my right eye, it's uh, substantially less able to see. What do they call it? They have these different numbers. So one is, uh, let's say, 20, the other one mm -hmm. is five. It's like so, it's such a huge difference. So mm. that would be interesting to find something that I can use or try to uh, improve this, the right eye. So yeah, I'll look into that. I'll talk to you off record and by email as well. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. 
So we're almost at the end. I do have a few more questions for you, the ending questions. Before that, would you like to add anything else that we didn't cover or didn't discuss today? Um, I think we covered, you know, mo most everything. You know, I just um, wanted to make sure, yeah, the story I think is really most um, pertinent to our, our interview. And, you know, and I think just the, the expansion of, you know, seaworthy growing into portworthy, you know, helping cancer patients as well as children with vision issues is it's just been a lovely way to grow. Um and I I mean I have I have a, a third a third division that I'm hoping I can work on in the next couple of years too. So um because I patented my um adhesives and my materials, I have realized also they're just so ultra sensitive and the breathability of them is, is really what helps for delicate skin. You know, your skin under your eye is probably your most sensitive skin. So, um, the third division that I've already organized is called wound worthy and it's for like geriatric patients who have really thin crepe skin because regular bandages will, will rip their skin off. So they need an ultra sensitive one. So I've actually had um, people tell me I, I had um, like a assisted living home reach out and let me know that they're using my patches on their patients. <laughs> so I, I'm hoping to create a third third extension to help the um, geriatric population sooner than later. <laughs> How wonderful. Thank you so much, Paige, again, for being open <laughs> to all these inspired oh. actions and creativity to help others. It's really, really precious to me. Thank you again for being open oh. to life and being you. <laughs> oh, thank you. And before we say goodbye today, I do have two questions. The first one is, what is another word for life? What comes to mind? Hmm. Another word for life. <laughs> like at the moment, my life, my life is very, I was like chaos because right now I'm just, we're in the middle of moving and I'm trying to work and kids. I feel like I'm in a bit of a chaotic period. So that came to mind, but, um, another word for life. I don't know. Life is beautiful. So maybe beauty. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. Beauty. And it could be the combination of chaotic beauty. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that really resonates true to me. <laughs> yes, yes. Yes. My last question is what three experiences you wish everyone to have before they lose the body, before they die? Mm. I hope I will. I hope they, they have the experience of falling in love. I hope they have a feeling of accomplishment. And I would hope they would have um, the experience of like the awe of discovery. Uh, yes. Because that's pretty nice too. Yeah, it resonates very much with me too. Thank you so much again, Paige, for your sharing wisdom, oh. <laughs> for being this beautiful inspiration for all of us, women and men, and helping children. Thank you for everything you do and we oh, you're welcome. you see life. Thank, <laughs> Thank you. you. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much for this interview. I appreciate it. I've enjoyed my time with you. Thank ah, you. Me too. And before we say goodbye, where can we find more information about you, your products, services, and future projects? Um, well, our website is um, www.worthybrands.com and there you can find all of our products and accessories. Uh, we're also available on Amazon and we have a presence on Instagram with, you can look at the handle Seaworthy Patches or Portworthy and you can learn more about our products, our services. You can learn more about the issues like amblyopia and early detection vision screening programs and cancers. Um, it's all there. And I, I think one of the really wonderful things that's happened on Instagram is there's a really, really supportive group of moms that will, you know, talk about things that they do for their patching kids, um, rewards or activities. And um, I created an app that helps kids stay distracted so they're not ripping their patches off. Um, and as far as I know, it's like the only app for kids that has them do exercise too. So they're moving and they're not just like zoning out to a screen. Um, so that I'm, I'm really proud of as well. 
Um, so yeah, I mean, I think it's just a great, there's, you know, a few different avenues and different ways to, to connect with us, um, on Instagram and our website. Yeah, that sounds really wonderful. And I love the way you expand into all these areas <laughs> that is needed to see and be treated and, and needs attention. Thank you so much again, Paige. And I'll have the no, link on your you. podcast profile as well. Thank you again. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. We'll talk soon. Bye for now. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye, -bye. Bye for now, Paige. Aloha. Thank you for listening. To learn more about Paige Broughton and her work, please visit worthybrands.com. To learn more about this podcast, please visit fitforjoy.org slash podcast. Thank you again for listening and bye for now.